About seven hours after the battle begins, Porus' army is nearly destroyed. But Porus himself survives. They're not completely destroyed, but probably three quarters of the army is killed. Porus himself, badly wounded, uh, continues to fight on. Alexander admires Porus' bravery and determination to keep fighting in the face of certain defeat. Alexander recognizes in Porus a kindred warrior spirit. He doesn't want to kill the man he's grown to respect, so he sends a messenger to call him for a meeting. Greek historian Arian records the conversation. Alexander was the first to speak. What, he said, do you wish that I should do with you? Treat me as a king ought, Porus famously replied. Alexander is so impressed with Porus's dignity and composure, he decides to let him remain as king and keep his territories and his subjects. So at the end of the day, Alexander, uh, at the Battle of, of the Hedispus River, shows his tactical brilliance. I mean, this is a guy who can read a battlefield. He has what Napoleon called the coup de wheel, the strike of the eye. By looking at the terrain, looking at the arrangement of forces, is able to devise, very quickly in this case, a tactical plan that plays to his own advantage. With his victory at Hedaspis, Alexander the Great has taken his first step across the Indian frontier, but it is also his last. As he advances deeper into India, several states set aside their own rivalries and now stand united against the invader. At the next battle site, Alexander is confronted by 300,000 Indian troops. In attempting to conquer India, you get the feeling that perhaps Alexander's strategic intelligence analysis was not as good as it had been in the past, because any reasonable view of what was going on in India at the time would have led you to the conclusion that this would be an almost impossible military task for what amounts to a small Greek army. By now, Alexander's men can see that their leader's quest has turned into a suicide mission. They've been fighting long and hard, and mutiny is in the air. He tries to rally them to keep going. He's inspirational, his troops are loyal, but they've just had enough. Alexander, always attuned to his men, ultimately surrenders to the will of his troops and heads south, returning to Babylon in modern-day Iraq. But his eastern adventure may have cost him his life. The best guess is that he died of malaria um, and uh, in Babylon where history says, or at least the texts say, because uh, he was considered to be Pharaoh of Egypt. His body was sent to Egypt, where it was embalmed, and put in a crystal casket. Alexander the Great, one of history's most brilliant military tacticians, dead at 33. The conqueror of much of the known world, his record and his leadership skills still stand as the inspiration for great military minds throughout history. During the first Gulf War in 1991, uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf took a page out of Alexander the Great's playbook with his left hook strategy. Like Alexander, Schwarzkopf essentially feigned a main attack on the Iraqi forces occupying Kuwait from the south. But the bulk of his force, modern-day heavy cavalry, tanks, swung hundreds of miles due west and came at the Iraqis right flank. There's the left hook, effectively knocking out the Iraqi army. Ground war in Operation Desert Storm was over in a hundred hours. That is a successful feign and envelop that Alexander would be proud of. Alexander the Great campaigned for more than 11 years, over 20,000 miles, and never lost a battle. Still, he was dissatisfied. It is one of the more interesting questions of history, of having achieved all of the strategic objectives that he set out to be, against all odds, by the way. Why does Alexander continue uh, to literally want more? Why is it not enough? And I, I think he's a very curious character, psychologically. But basically, I think he's a very traditional Greek. You know, when you look at the history of Greece, uh, Greek 
uh, soldiers didn't fight for strategic reasons or even political goals. I mean, that's something that comes in much later, all right? Because uh, there's no sense of, of, of being Greek. There's no Greek nation, per se. So what did they fight for? They fought for honor and individual glory. A forger of empires with an unquenchable thirst for glory, Alexander spread Greek culture throughout the known world. Yet he died yearning to have conquered more.